you have a prepaid call from an inmate at California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility and State Prison at Corcoran in Corcoran, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using. Yeah. How you doing? Hey, how's it going? Oh, I'm good. Be good. All right, still? So, okay. uh, I'm very, you know, people want to correspond about, you know, uh, you know, that, like, hey, how I change and stuff like that. That's cool. What's your nationality? Uh, I'm Caucasian, uh, white. Were you ever part of any gangs, groups, or organizations? Um, yeah, so I grew up in the Harbor area. Uh, I'm actually out of Torrance. Uh, I grew my stopping grounds included, uh, you know, the hometown, Hermosa, Redondo, Lamita, Wilmington, Carson, and Compton. Uh, as a kid, I used to hang out with a lot of ex-cons, and my uncle and all the older homeboys were uh, referred to as South Bay or Baby Blue Wrecking Crew. So I ran Baby Blue with my uncle and pretty much a bunch of other white guys who ran amok. Um, we had each other's backs and hit licks. Coming into prison, I got recruited as a skin. Coming in, I uh, didn't want to be run of the mill Peckerwood or white good boy. I wanted to be part of the hierarchy in the know and not just cannon fodder. Okay, so so what did they call you, or, or um, what do you go by? Uh, I've always been known as Noodles. Okay, can you tell us how you uh, grew up in your upbringing and um and your childhood and things of that nature? Did you come from a single parent home? What was more parents available? Did you go into foster care and things of that nature? Yeah. So uh, I'm uh, the son of Dave and Levitt. My father was an uh, active duty Marine and he died three months before I was born. He was on leave one weekend and he drowned. Um, like I said, I was three months before I born, it was born. So, you know, the story as I've heard it goes, he and my mom went on a boat and went fishing at a lake. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. My mom was five months pregnant and she got hungry. My father dropped her off at uh, the shore where the car was and she went to a McDonald's in town. When she got back, he was in the water face down. You know, sometimes I think shoulda, coulda, woulda. Uh, I often wonder how different my uh, life would have been had my father not drowned. As it happened, so he did. Um, I really don't know all the ins and outs of this story, right? I've heard it in bits and pieces. Apparently, my father was pretty uh, responsible young man. When he died, he left a significant amount of money to my mom and his unborn son. Uh, when he died, uh, it sent my mom into a downward spiral. She took off with a swollen belly and a purse full of money and dealt with her grief and her guilt the only way she knew how. Uh, I think she really felt like kind of guilty because she was hungry and she took off and blamed herself for you know him falling and hitting his head and drowning. Uh, she, uh, she took, she turned to drugs and promiscuity, uh, you know, a lot of young women have a child and they become responsible, they clean up their act, and, uh, that motherly intuition takes over, not the case of mine. Uh, she had me, and then she was pregnant again within a couple months. There was more drugs and promiscuity, another kid, you know, getting poisoned in the womb, uh, and then within months of having her second child, she had a third. Uh, when this one was born, she got her tubes tied. Probably the smartest thing she ever did. All right, but back to my childhood. For whatever reason, my mom hooked up with guys who thought I was sexier than she was. I found out about my first molestation secondhand. Uh, my memories really start here. My mom eventually ended up with a deranged son of a bitch. His name was Tom. This man uh, molested me and would uh, physically abuse me by choking me. Uh until I passed out. Um, you know, I don't know if it was the drugs my mom did when she was pregnant with me, but I was prone to having tantrums as a child. They were pretty bad, too. I'd be inconsolable and violent. Um, they were pretty bad, like I said. My mom would uh, sit on top of me until I spent all my energy and fell asleep holding my hands so I uh, couldn't scratch her and moving my head so I couldn't bite her and stuff. Um, you know... My deceased father, Dave, being a Marine, he left me with uh, really good medical insurance. So 
so um, I would get checked in a hospital like Charter, and I was diagnosed with bipolar with mood swings. Um, other than medications, I was released with some uh, parental instructions on restraint moves and some uh, apparatuses to go with it, um, kind of like uh, so I wouldn't bite my tongue or, uh, you know, so they can get my hands and stuff. All this gave Tom the perfect situation to practice and uh, fine-tune his deviance. Um, you know, this man, uh, he molested me and would physically abuse me by choking me till I passed out. Like I said, he would tell me how easy it would be to make me never wake up again. He would come home from work late at night. Most parents may come home and look in on their child and maybe kiss him on the forehead. Well, he got a kick out of flipping my mattress over with me on it. Um, I'd be dead asleep and scared shitless, and he would just laugh. Uh, sometimes he'd point his finger at me uh, like a gun, cock back his thumb and shoot me. Um, you know, needless to say, I was scared shitless of this man. I did what he said when he said it, and I kept my mouth shut. My behavior combined with bruises, got CPS called, and I was removed from the house. It's kind of hard to explain when it comes to this, right? But I felt like I got kidnapped by the state. Why'd they take me, not my brothers, you know? Um, am I in trouble? What did I do wrong? Did I deserve this? Um, you know, despite the abuse at home, the group home seemed worse, uh, so I'd run away. Due to all the quote-unquote trouble I caused, I wasn't welcome at home anymore. Uh, Mom didn't want me, freaking, you know, I was just outcast. So uh, I stayed at my uncle's house. It was a straight-up heroin trap house. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. But I loved it there. All the junkies were cool as hell. They treated me really, really good over there. Uh, they fed me better than I've been fed. Um, you know, they thanked me when I brought them ties or cottons and stuff. You know, um, sometimes I, like, uh, ride my scooter down the street, you know, backpack full of dope and stuff because, you know, the kids don't get as much trouble as adults and they just cold trail me make sure I didn't get jacked. Um, Looking back, I think I equated the heroin with love and acceptance. Um, and it just kind of, I thought it would make me feel safe and good because I felt really good there. You know, I was almost 11 years old when I decided I wanted to shoot heroin. There were so many leftovers at the house, like it was really easy to get. I knew how they did it because I watched them fix a hundred times. I helped them out sometimes. Uh, um, and I always bring them toilet paper to like, get the blood off their arms and you know it, it like it, it was cool there like I said I like to help them out because they always gave me a pat on the back um, so one day I was alone and I went through the motions and filled a syringe um, with enough hair to kill 10 little Sean's uh, I remember I put the needle in my arm and I couldn't get the register part down and I pushed the plunger just a little bit and it hurt so I pulled it out uh, I had a bunch of little, like, these things on my arms and shit. Uh, my uncle came in, and I thought he was going to beat the shit out of me. I thought he was going to kill me. Uh, I was scared, and I didn't know what he was going to do. Uh, I'll never know why he did this, because uh, he ended up dying. Uh, maybe he saw my determination. Maybe he felt sorry for me. Maybe he thought I'd get sick and never do it again, but he gave me my first six. Just a couple of cc's, but if it's love at first glance, I didn't get sick. That day, I married the needle. Everything I did after that was to get hair. By the time I was 18, I had a three gram a day habit. I was getting progressively out of control. I didn't have any respect for the rights, liberties, or safety of others. No empathy or compassion. I was just a selfish human being, and I was hurting people every single day, creating victims every day, and I was proud of it. I got off on the respect I commanded through fear, like everybody in the neighborhood, you know. Me and my friends, we all seemed to be kind of like alpha males, and we'd be competing for uh, superiority. Each one trying to be cooler and harder than the next, and nobody uh, had any common sense whatsoever. Like, everybody applauded, like, you know, stomping somebody out or hitting the way over the head with a skateboard. It was just silly uh, looking back on it. Um, Nobody held the other back. We all applied each other in our stupid and senseless behavior. Oh, it's kind of a trip looking back on it. And that was kind of like my childhood. Okay, what are you incarcerated for and how long is your sentence? All right, so 
I'm in here for murder in the first degree. I got uh, assault with a deadly weapon and arson of personal property. I killed a girl named Amanda, and I lit her body on fire. Um, I got a weapon in hand. You have 60 seconds remaining. Use of a deadly weapon and inflicting great bodily injury. And uh, what I did earned me uh, 33 years, eight months to life in prison, and a whole bunch of guilt and shame. And, and how long have you been incarcerated? I've been incarcerated for almost 21 years now. Okay, can you take us back and, and um, let us know how you played out as far as um, the day or night you committed that crime? And, um, you know, what was going through your head? Were you under the, you know, what what was going on that day? Can you, um, you know, um, elaborate and explain on that? All right. So, uh, the night I committed my crime, um, I was at my house. And uh, we had a couple of girls there, a couple of guys there, and we were just kicking it, getting high, doing a little bit of drinking. Um, all of us knew each other. The girls were new to the circle a little bit, um, but there's a couple ones that have been around for a while. Me, Matt, and Amanda, we took off sk on skateboards, um, and we were going to go to the park. Uh, we were going to go get some pot over at Matt's house, and uh, and I, I needed some hair, so I need to get it fixed. Um, so uh, we left uh, Matt's sister at my place uh, with my brother. Uh, my homeboy Tyler was there, and we left them there just to chill. And uh, we went uh, skateboarding. Um, when we got over to Matt's house, uh, I was feeling kind of bad. Uh, I hadn't fixed since the morning, and uh, I called uh, the homeboy uh, Robert. He's also known as Bullet. And I told him uh, we were shooting over to the park and to run a ground my way. Uh, he picked up for me, and uh, I slid him 50 bucks, and we went to the park. I needed to get well and was going to go to this truck bay. Like at the park, it had this little drop-down spot where trucks dropped off supplies and stuff. And I could bust out my works in private and, you know, and do what I needed to do. So um, we're at the park, and I told Amanda and Matt and Robert, I'll be back. And for some reason, Amanda wanted to go with me, and I don't know if she didn't want to be um, left with those fools. I, I have no idea why. She just kind of wanted to follow me down there. So uh, everyone ended up following me, and I got out my works and nicked off a quarter, and I was cooking my get well. Um, Amanda started asking questions, and I'm focused, and I'm doing my stuff. And I put my rig together. I had a glass rig with screw on point and all that stuff. And uh, something about that needle, uh, it riled her up, like, big time. Um, I didn't really get why she was tripping. Um, I knew she was game savvy. Like, uh, she used the speed, blew a little bit of weed and stuff like that. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to do my shot, and I'm like, uh, what the fuck are you tripping on? You know, I'm getting mad now a little bit. And... Uh, Matt and Robert, they're just sitting there watching and laughing. I remember saying something along the lines of, man, shut the fuck up or beat, or beat feet, bitch. She slapped my works off of the brick wall and everything went down. The spoon, the rig, um, the glass rig uh, shattered on the floor. And I, I think back to like how I felt, right? And I just remember feeling despair and then rage and like so much anger, like I just blew up. It was fucking nuts, like, how much I felt like I, I just saw it. Uh, I didn't think at all, and I only remember bits and pieces. I know that I grabbed her by the neck with both hands, and I must have looked hella scary because both of them, both, uh, both of them were bigger than me, and they ran. And even today, like, every day I trip on that a lot, and they resented, uh, they didn't come to her defense, like, why didn't you stop me, you know? Um... But I still gotta take blame for what I did. I can't put that on anybody else, you know. But it, but it, it bugs me, like. But uh, you know, twelve dollars worth of dope. That's all it was, and that's what her life was worth to me in that moment. You know, honestly, it doesn't matter if it's twelve, a thousand, a million. It doesn't matter. Um, it's just shameful and cowardly and despicable, and it haunts me like every day. Um, 
this poor girl, I expected so much violence in those seconds. It was uh, quick and hectic as hell. Um, I know I slammed her head on the ground when I swept her feet, and I know that that knocked her out cold. Uh, and so, like, that's, I don't know, say, what we could call that, if it was saving grace or what. I know she didn't feel much pain because it was done at that. Um, I honestly don't remember pulling the knife and stabbing her nine times. I don't even remember seeing her at all. I didn't see Amanda, like, even the slightest. Um, if I did, if I saw that girl in those seconds there, there's no way I could have done what I did. Um, you know, I've had a lot... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. ...and reflect on it. And in that moment, in that flurry of emotions and my frenzied and violent episode, I was killing every skeleton, every ghost in my closet, calling my molester and tormentor. Uh, you know, uh, everyone who ever kicked my ass, all of them, uh, she took on 19, 20 years of pent up rage. Um, there's no thoughts to really be taken from, but like I said, I knocked her out, a, and, like, immediately that first hit, and it was so hard and happened so fast. I mean, hey, I, I, I hope that, you know, the fear and the pain was kind of minimized by that. Um, you know, this act was senseless and ugly, and I hated myself for it for a long, long time. Um, I remember taking the side streets home after that, and I got home, and I cleaned up. Uh, I know I I needed to get well. I was shaky and sick and tripping, but I still had the rest of that heroin and uh, the slam, and, uh, you know, I, I cooked it and shot it. Um... Uh, as soon as I got showered and dressed, it, it was like perfect timing. It seemed like Matt called, most likely looking to tell his sister and maybe get her out. Um, but I answered instead. Matt asked me, uh, what happened, dude? And I told him, matter of fact, that I killed her. And then I asked him where he was and told him to stay there. I'm coming to get him. I picked him up and I told him that we're going to light her body on fire. And he looked scared. I actually, you know, I contemplated killing him in that moment. I didn't think or really contemplate these actions. I just know that growing up hood, there are things you do if you do a crime. Get rid of the evidence and don't leave no witnesses. Um, we drove, I had a Sousa Trooper, we hopped in that, and we drove to the gas station on the way. We grabbed a gallon milk jug and filled it up and went back to the park. I made him come with me, but he was scared shitless and just going through the motions with me, um, he couldn't do it. I wanted him to light the body on fire. I'm telling him, light the body on fire, do it. And he just couldn't go down there, either because he wasn't able to stomach the scene or he thought I was going to kill him. I don't know, uh, but he wouldn't go down there with me. So I ended up pouring the gasoline over her body. And even when I poured that gas, I don't remember seeing her at all. I didn't see a man on the ground. I didn't see nobody. It was just pouring gas on the dirty, bloody concrete. Like, it's a trip. Um, I poured the gas all all the way out, and I barely remembered at the end to pour a trail of gas to light it. Um, I lit the fire, and we both took off running. I still remember, like, uh, I, smell, I could smell the hair burning. Like, even as fast as I ran, it just, like, it went up quick, and I remember the hair smell, and, um, hey, that's it the grossest smell you ever smell. Um, we ran back to my truck after that, and I took him at home. I told him straight up, I'm like, hey, uh, you're an accomplice with this dude. If I go down, so do you. I told him if you talk, you die. Um, then I went back to my house. I drank almost half a pint of Palma sauce, smoked some pot, and fell asleep. How did the um, law enforcement manage to arrest you or catch you? How did what? How did law enforcement manage to find out who did it? And how did they manage yeah. to pinpoint it to you and, and later on arrest you for the crime? All right. So uh, as I told you, Matt and Robert took off running when I grabbed Amanda by the neck. You know, I'm solely responsible for my actions that night. I'm solely responsible for killing Amanda. I, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I can't really blame nobody, right? And I wish so badly that Matt and Robert would have stopped me, fought me, restrained me, jumped me, kicked my fucking ass, like, anything to stop me, shoot me, stab me, whatever, anything that they ran. And I think about that a lot, like, hey, and it's, it, it, it's crazy. 
Um, how I got caught, though, I don't know where Robert ran off to, but Matt went to his friend Nick's house, and he told him what happened at the park. Nick took it as tweaker talk and kicked Matt out of the house, and I guess the next day, Nick's father drove by the park where I killed Amanda, saw the commotion, the cops, and when he got home, he told his son. Um, I guess Nick told his dad what happened, and they went to the park and told the detectives what they knew. They helped him find Matt, and he supplied them with enough information to get a plain sight search warrant. Um, every morning when I woke up, I do a shot of to get well. The homegirl Joanna came by every morning, and we blow her out, and uh, she left and went home. Me and my homeboy Tyler, we are fixing to go to Compton and uh, get some dope. We were leaving my house, and when I stepped outside, there were like 40 cops just pointing guns, screaming, get down, get down. They searched my place. Uh, they found bloody like, skateboards, shoes, clothes, and that was it. I was done. They took me in. They arrested me, booked me. Eventually, a rain tried and convicted me, and here I am all these years later. Okay, so I'm gathering that um, if you were never addicted um, on drugs, that um, you would never commit that crime. And also, I know that it takes it takes hold of you and it took control of you, mind, body, and soul. I know, like your childhood was uh, a rough one, um, considering the molestation and the foster care, and also the introduction of uh, hair to your life by the family members and even teaching you how to do it. So, my question to you is, considering all that, you know, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. It's a tough predicament to be into, you know. Um, you know, especially family members will be involved. What message would you have to say to individuals out here, young or old, that might be addicted to drugs or might, you know, go through the same situation of molestation and things of that nature? All right. So, uh, so those of you out there stuck in your addiction. Um, those of you so-called self-medicate with any kind of drug, I can tell you anything. Your family can tell you, your wife, your kids, a priest, a thousand other people can tell you you have a problem. We both know that doesn't mean shit. you got to come to the conclusion for yourself, dude. Until you sit back, look at your life and how stuff keeps playing out uh, between you and yours, you know, you got to come to that conclusion yourself. So you get tired of every relationship you have or had falling apart before your eyes until you associate your bad actions, your immorality, your lack of spirituality, your moral fiber. Just plain old human decency. Until you realize that and uh, associate it with your vice. Until this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Until you see that your irresponsibility, your damaged relationships, total lack of spirituality is it's combined with your vice, you aren't going to hear nothing. Nothing anybody has to say. But if you get to that point and you want to talk, you want to make a change, reach out to someone, man. There's a lot of resources out there. If you got no one in your life and want to talk about getting straight, hell, write me. Email me. We can review your options together, man. You know, it's like this, right? A lot went into the murder of Amanda, a lot. It wasn't just her and getting well there. You know, there's a lot of built-up rage, but being a heroin addict, knowing myself from being empathetic, compassionate, just a moral person, contributed to her senseless and horrific death. If I could share my experience with anybody, if you can relate to my story, my journey, if you're able to gain some kind of insight or wisdom or just some common fucking sense, if this prevents another Amanda from being murdered, then she didn't die in vain. Knowing yourself only works for so long. Um, you know, once you cut yourself off from empathy, you become capable of making your community unsafe in an ugly place. Everyone's a potential mark. Eventually, you're going to hurt somebody or, or yourself. Uh, eventually, you're going to kill someone or yourself or want to kill yourself at the end of the day. Who's the mark then? Uh, I'd say, you know, it took me 15 years to realize this and 20 to put it to words like this. It hasn't been an easy road, and uh, I wouldn't wish it on nobody. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So, talking to all those victims out there, if you hear this and you're being touched by anybody, if you are a girl or a boy that's been raped, held down, they said no, and they said yes, don't be silent. 
say something. Tell somebody, tell an adult. I guarantee you have at least one person in this world that you trust somewhere. You know, there's somebody there that's going to listen to you and they're going to help you or at least guide you to the place where you're going to find help, right? You know, if you're young, you know, you got to know that anything in the swimsuit areas, it's off limits, man. Fucking, um, if you're being touched inappropriate by anybody, if a man or a woman's telling you that what they'd like to do to you in a sexual way, say something. It's not supposed to be going down. Uh, teacher, cop, friend, neighbor, say something to somebody. I know it's going to be scary. It's going to suck. And the family especially. Uh, you're going to feel guilty because people are getting jammed up and it sucks, dude. It's the shittiest thing. I remember getting turned away from my own home when I ran away. They're like, nah, you brought too much drama here, dude. You know, they kicked me loose. Um, you know, that person who's been telling you deserve this and that it's a punishment, nobody deserves to be fondled, molested, raped. It's never a punishment. It's this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Children and adults, they don't have secrets. If an adult's telling you this uh, is our secret, don't tell anyone. They're evil. They're predators, straight up. Kids and adults don't have secrets. Um, there's help out there. There's amenities available. Take advantage of them. I didn't. You know, my shame, it ruled my life. You know, today it's a little bit different with uh, sexuality and, you know, boys on boys, girls on girls, transgender, all that stuff. I'm not really articulate or in the know about that stuff, but back in the 80s and 90s, you know, uh, I was brought up in the hood and homosexuality was not acceptable. And me being the victim of uh, me getting molested by a man, it filled me with shame and guilt. Um, sometimes I question my masculinity and I wonder, hey, am I freaking fat? You know, being gay was a bad thing back then. It was nasty, it was wrong, and it was fighting worse to be called a Um, I made sure that nobody was ever going to guess my interpersonal shame, and I fought all the time. I I would fight everybody, and nobody calls a guy that they're afraid of bad names. And so I started to like feeling being a badass, and I liked the acceptance and the validation and the respect that that brought me. So I started to get go harder in the pain progressively getting more and more violent. Nobody called me a fag ever, you know, and this is one of the things that built up to my killing, this poor girl. I'm telling you, if anybody's touching you, if anybody's hurting you in any type of way, physical or sexual, tell somebody. Okay, I don't have no um, other questions for you, but do you have anything else to address or add? All right, so I heard about this platform and I liked uh, the message that they were putting forward. Um, you got a cool service where, you know, victims can find a little bit of closure maybe. They can listen to these stories. They might be able to relate to them. Not necessarily find forgiveness, but at least be able to let go of some of that resentment. I know that my victimization, the way that I looked at everything and everybody, was through resentful eyes and you know it caused me to hurt a lot of people um, not being able to deal with these emotions and bottling all this crap up so you know even in my day to day I wonder about the people that I victimized that I beat up how did they take that did they pass that hurt on because it said hurt people hurt people right um, you know now I'm kind of healing and not healed not by a long shot you know, but I took drugs out of my life. I, I'm not trying to create no more victims. I, in my day-to-day, -day, whether it's talking or physical, I, I, I make sure to, uh, you know, cater to people's emotions and let them know, hey, you know, things uh, don't have to go to fit like, all the time. I mean, we, we can talk about this. That's hard to do in prison. It really is. Um, you know, this platform's really cool. You know, if the victims can find some kind of closure through this, I mean... That's living amends right there. I mean, it, you know, there's so many of us after all these years that, you know, get to that point where it's like, how can I make this right? How can I find some kind of self-worth, some kind of walk where I can feel comfortable in my shoes, where I don't feel like I have to prove myself to everybody and everything? Um, you know, th there's good ways to handle, you know, emotions, and, you know, sometimes we just let it turn to anger. 
Um, I think it's another good thing for the community to see that, you know, nobody is um, below redemption and nobody's uh, above uh, reproach. Um, this is a good platform for that. Um, since I've been down my entire term, you know, I didn't allow myself to have any romantic uh, aspirations because of my self-worth. I didn't feel like I deserved to have anything good. Um, I've tortured myself for a lot of years over this, and, you know, I never thought I brought anything to the table. And I didn't want to lock nobody down, make them do my time with me. None of that stuff. I'm getting to the end of my road, and I feel like I'm the luckiest man in the world, you know? Um, I met a woman, finally, and I sat there, and we met through, uh, by chance, through a mutual acquaintance, um, and it was crazy because, like, it wasn't supposed to be. It was an accidental call, just wanted to talk for a second, and um, it took off like fire. It was like, uh, you know, two people needed to talk to someone and didn't even know it. When I first met uh, my fiance, I told her straight up, hey, you know, I'm just looking for some friendships, you know. Not necessarily somebody to live vicariously through, um, but, you know, I'm not trying to lock you down, hold you hostage from life, make you do my time. There's no telling when and where I'm going to get out, you know. And she was already kind of feeling me, and she told me straight up, she's like, that's not your choice to make. That's just a woman's choice to make, like, you know. At that point, you know, it opened my eyes, it opened my heart to a whole new world where, you know, I could actually hope and dream and aspire for stuff, you know. Uh, once we started talking, um, you know, uh, yeah, once we started to talk, though, uh, let me tell you, uh, we spilled the beans for real. We had so much that we needed to get out, and it was like leech and poison. It was crazy. We were throwing everything away, all the freaking baggage, all the dirt bags that came before, you know, all, all the hurt, the distrust, everything. You know, we're letting go of all our resentments and working through our guilt and our shame. And we found we had a lot of similarities. You know, sympathy's cool, right? It's a nice, caring, compassionate person feels bad for what you went through, and they can send you condolences, right? But we had something better. We had empathy, you know. We're both hood. We've both been there. We've done that. And we're able to say, hey, I understand what you're going through. Or this is how I'm dealing with this or how I dealt with that. You know, um, that's how we came to love each other and help each other through, like, some hard times. Um, we cast out our self-doubt and our insecurities, and we've grown quite a bit. Like, uh, I never, never thought I'd have something like this. Never thought I deserved it. Um, you know, starting to find some worth in, my, in myself, and, you know, when she and I started picking each other up, you know, always picking each other up, you know, never putting each other down. You know, she became my first love. And honestly, I don't want another. My only, that's my only love. I, I, you know, it's my hope, my dream, my goal. I got a plan with her. I got a home. I got a family. I got a life. And that's everything I never had. I got that with her. She gave that to me. Like, she's the most generous and compassionate and cool, loving woman. And, uh, you know, in the bargain, you know, she found a man she can trust. You know, uh, she could tell anything to me. I held her confidence, and eventually I got her heart. It's been hard for both of us at times, and especially for her. She had a lot of past betrayals, lying, stealing, cheating, physical abuse. Uh, for me, I've dealt with self-worth and abandonment issues, issues with trust, contributing to a relationship from in prison. That's tough. Uh, being vulnerable and fearful, you know, it, it's that's scary, you know, putting my heart out there. You know, we've persevered and gotten stronger, you know, battling through all this. Um, as for my commitment offense, she met and got to know and fell in love with Sean, the recovered drug addict, the remorseful man and the compassionate human being. She fell in love with the man I am and that uh, I'm still evolving to be. She didn't fall in love with noodles, not the irresponsible and progressively violent, drug-addicted man. You know, not really a man. I can't say I was a man. It was like a man child, you know, just doing stupid stuff. You know, um, you know, of course today, you know, she and I talk about everything, including relapse prevention, anger management, um, you know, uh, maintaining medication for mental health and community service. And she's come to trust me. She trusts the man that I am today and has replaced the whole who I was then. And 
she knows that I shot and I'm here to stay. Um, you know, this is an excellent platform and I'm really thankful that I got to share my experience. And if there's any questions, comments, concerns, anybody has anything they want to shoot my way, and I'd be down to answer those. And you have 60 seconds remaining. Do, do you want to give a shout out to any um, family or friends? Um, you know, the only person I really give a shout out to is my woman. Uh, you know who you are. You're the badass that has my heart, and uh, you're the one that keeps me in check. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to a long, awesome life with you and building, building great things. I am so glad to have a place that I call home. You know, I never had that before, and I love the shit out of you for fucking allowing me into your life, and I'm so thankful to have you in mind. Um, I want to see good things ahead for us. Hey, and to my homeboy Jason, uh, you know, you're my only friend in this world, you know. You and Jen, you guys are doing good things. You're raising two freaking girls, and uh, I'm proud of you, bro. Stick to, uh, stick to your medicine. Stay with the maintenance. Stay away from the fucking heroin. Don't make bad choices and decisions, bro. If I see you back here, uh, we're gonna bump heads for real. Um, you know, that's it. Yeah.